In this video, we will be looking at topic six of GCSE chemistry, and that is the rate and extent of chemical change. Here are the subtopics we'll be looking at throughout this video. And as always, all of these pages will be available on my Etsy, which is linked in the description. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoy. First of all, we have rates of reaction. The rate of a chemical reaction is simply how fast the reactants are changed into products. We have two examples, we have slow reactions and fast reactions. Slow reactions include things like chemical weathering and the rusting of iron, where fast reactions are things like burning and explosions. Those fast reactions are fairly common sense, those slow reactions you may not immediately think of, but could be useful examples to use in an exam. Factors affecting the rate of reaction. There are four factors here, temperature, surface area, concentration, and a catalyst. So temperature, simply a higher temperature increases the energy in the particles and therefore the particles move faster. And because they move faster, those collisions will occur more and they will have more energy so that activation energy will not be a problem before they react. The surface area, the higher the surface area to volume ratio is, the more surfaces the particles have to play with. So you can imagine if you've got a big block of something and all these particles are trying to hit it effectively, then they can only attack it from the outside and slowly work their way inside. But if you suddenly break that block up into 10 different pieces, all of those inside areas can also be attacked as well and it will be broken down much, much quicker. Concentration, simply higher concentration means more particles and more collisions because there will be more particles in that. Higher concentration means more particles, and because there's more particles, there will be more collisions within that set volume. And finally, the presence of a catalyst. A catalyst reduces the activation energy required to start a reaction. So an example of a catalyst would be an enzyme, which is a biological catalyst, and these work by basically just breaking down the substrate into smaller pieces. As you can see at the bottom, every one of these factors simply leads to more particle collisions. Next we have measuring the rate of reaction. So we have an equation up at the top. You can either use the amount of reactant used or the amount of product that is formed over time. And there are three ways to measure the rate of reaction in an actual experiment. So the precipitation and color change. For example, how long does it take for a visual change? And this visual change could be a color change or the idea of going transparent to opaque or reverse depending on what your reaction is. Another one is the volume of gas produced, so you could use a gas syringe. The more gas that's produced, the faster the reaction is, and you can also record how much gas there is at certain time frames, which you could then use to graph the process to see, does it kind of start really quickly and then slow down a bit, or is it quite linear the whole way through, those kind of things. And finally, the change in mass. So you could put your experiment on a mass balance, or effectively scales, and over time, you would expect a gas to be let off into the atmosphere. And because of that, there is going to be less stuff on your scales. So there will be a mass decrease normally. Next, we are talking about using graphs to measure the rate of reaction. So here is a graph you may have. And your initial curve might just be the dark purple curved line. Now, the things I've added on there is... There will be, in an exam question, for example, a certain time. So it could say, after five seconds, what is the rate of reaction? So your purple line, going straight up the dotted one, would go to five seconds and join up to the curve. From there, you would draw a tangent. So a line that simply just touches the curve at that five-second point. And you want to extend that line to make it nice and long. Once you've done that, find two nice coordinates, I often say. So if you can find two kind of whole number values that work, it's going to make your life a lot easier. If not, just two random values fairly far apart so that you can create a triangle with the two black lines like I have here. After this, you want to find out the change in the Y and the change in the X values. And then you simply put them into the equation at the bottom. So rate equals the change in Y over change in X. Those of you that are on it with your maths equations, this is the same as just finding the gradient in a maths question. As you can see, I've simplified and summarised those four points on the right-hand side that will take you through the process that I just explained. Next, we have reversible reactions. So, at the bottom, a reversible reaction always reaches equilibrium in a closed system. 
First of all, I want you to let me know in the comments any reversible reactions that you can think of, because it will be really useful that you are aware of at least one or two that you could refer to in your exams if it came up. And as you can see at the top, the reversible reaction symbol, instead of having the normal arrow that we would have in these equations, it's kind of half an arrow going forwards and half an arrow going backwards. So the way a reversible reaction works is A plus B would make a product C plus D, but then that C plus D may react to produce A and B again. So again, let me know those examples in the comments. But as you can see our cycle here, if we start in the top left, the forward reaction begins, those reactants are used up as the product is created. So say you've got a lot of the A plus B and you don't have any of the C plus D yet. A load of that A plus D will create the products, the C plus D. The forward reaction then slows as there becomes more product. So once your reactant kind of gets used up, the C plus D will become more and more. And because of this, the backwards reaction then begins and the product is used up to make the reactants again. And again, as the products are used up and the reactants become more again, the backwards reaction slows and then the whole cycle continues again. And this will just continue going round and round until you finally reach equilibrium. That term closed system that I talked about at the start just means that there is nothing being added or no changes being made to the system while it's active. Because you can imagine if you think you've finally reached equilibrium and then all of a sudden a load more reactant gets added, there's going to be no longer any equilibrium and it's going to have to start the whole process again. Or if at one end the products started to get released as they were being made, there would not be a way to kind of reproduce those reactants if there's no product there anymore. And finally we have Le Chatelier's principle. But if you change the conditions of a reversible reaction, the system will try and counteract this change. That is effectively what the principle is. So two examples here. If you increase the pressure on one side, the equilibrium will shift to the other side to reduce the pressure. You don't really need to worry too much about what the equilibrium shifting means, but having the terminology there is good. And another one, if you decrease the pressure, the equilibrium will shift to produce more heat. So it just kind of naturally balances it out as you would expect. And this process continues for other factors in exactly the same way. And that is the end of topic six, the rate and extent of chemical change. Next will be topic seven, which is organic chemistry. Thank you very much for watching. Like and subscribe if you found it useful.